Hi, I'm Tony Hill. And I'm Jonathan Scott. And you're watching Sports Plus Dallas. On October 5th, the Cowboys took on the Texans at what many thought was AT&T Stadium, the Cowboys Stadium. But listening to the crowd, you never would have thought that that, stadium, that that stadium belonged to the Cowboys. In reality, it sounded like it belonged to the Texans. What do you think, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I definitely believe so. Uh, the, the Texans travel well. Uh, they came <laughs> travel well. <laughs> they travel well. They definitely travel well. They came in ready to play, and uh, it was. It was, it was an exciting game for football. You NFL. know, I was at the game, I was watching the game, and I had a chance to watch the Cowboys, but I looked up in the stands, and for the first time, again, you know, I, I looked up there and I said, Jonathan, man, how is Jerry Jones selling these tickets? What is he doing for this squad? I mean, you got to understand, home court advantage is huge for a ball club, especially when you're playing a rivalry, and that the worst, a worst case scenario is that, you know, the Texans dominating the crowd, dominating the signals that are being called. I mean, Romo had to go to a silent count in his own stadium. That's got to be utterly ridiculous. I mean, when I'm at home, if I'm a player, I'm thoroughly upset, and I want our crowd to step up and be a participant and let us know, hey, we're cheering for the Cowboys. Yeah, I definitely think that um, it was definitely a away game for them. But <laughs> it, it shows a little bit of character of how, how, how you handle the crowd. Uh, it was a hostile environment. <laughs> kind of weird, but it was a hostile environment environment for them, but they did a good job. And now, now that's crazy. You're, you're, you're saying it's a hostile environment. <laughs> you're playing at home. But, you know, in reality, you look at this game, and in a game that it seemed like the Cowboys had dominated the game, you know, I mean, although they had a couple turnovers, but at the end of the game, they were looking good, and all of a sudden, they find themselves in overtime. And what I took from this game, Jonathan, is that they not only showed some, in my opinion, a lot of heart, but I think this team grew up, and I think this is the first time they've taken not only not baby steps, but they took a big step forward, and a result of that was Romo playing outstanding, uh, making some big plays, and sticking to the running game. Yeah, and I think um, that the Cowboys showed a lot of resilience, especially in the, the, later, ha the later half of the game. Uh, they, they went, when they got into overtime, they went in, they, they, they didn't worry about being down, they came in, executed, bam, won the game. DeMarco Murray, I mean, this guy's playing fabulous. I mean, here's a guy, he's on pace for 1,600 yards, he's in an elite company. He, I mean, he's in a company, we're talking Jim Brown, we're talking O.J. Simpson, only two individuals who had 100-yard games, five games in a row. However, he's also on another pace to have 16 fumbles in 16 games, which is ironic to see, you know, when you, when you Put yourself up amongst these elite runners. One thing about those runners, they didn't fumble the ball. But what's your thought process about Murray? I mean, would you ask him to change the way he's running the ball? Or? Well, yeah, I, I think what it is is that, especially with these upcoming opponents, you got to be cognitive of holding that, holding that rock high and tight. Um, I think that's, if he, he works on that skill set, that will put him in the elite category because he's doing a great job. The offensive line is blocking well for him. And, and, and kind of segue to the offensive line. They're doing a great job. I, I can't say anything bad about them. They're getting after the ball. They're moving the line of scrimmage. And I can, I can pretty much guarantee five games will be won just off of the off offensive line alone. Well, the offensive line, they've got, you know, people talk about the offensive line, but remember this, fans and listeners out there and our, and our, and our, and our fans out here, Remember this, though. The Cowboys have three number one draft choices on that offensive line. They've got some big boys, especially on the left side, which is important. When you have a quarterback who's, who's gone through some injuries, who has back problems, he most certainly has to have his literally back covered from his blind side. Yeah. He's got three big boys doing a good job over there. And as a result, Romo's starting to look like his old self. I mean, anytime you can get out of the way of J.J. Watt mm -hmm. in a crucial situation and then make a big play, that's huge for the Cowboys, not only for Romo's uh, persona, but as well as the Cowboy. And I think that was a huge booster for them. Yeah, and, and just kind of going back to, to morale and things of that nature, I think it's definitely necessary to keep, keep this momentum going. Stick to the running game. Murray had 31, 31 carries, 31 totes. That's a lot of totes, but at the same time, incorporating play action, things of that nature, creating separation with Dez, get them one-on-one -on -one matchups. They keep this pace going. They can possibly be uh, in contention for a playoff well, situation. The, and the good thing about that, you're absolutely correct. One is that they're running the, they're running the clock, clock manager, which is important, and which has been a fault of Garrett in the past. I mean, they talk about Garrett throwing the ball too much, not making the appropriate timeouts, um, just really not making good calls overall. Well, now that he's handed the offense over, uh, I think in terms of sticking to the game plan, running the ball, Passing the ball as a receiver, we always want to pass. And, of course, Des Bryant, we'll talk about him in a moment, really stepped up. But 
Romo is distributing the ball to everyone. In this particular game, I saw five different, different receivers get the ball. I saw Cole Beasley make three first down catches, which is huge. I saw Dwayne Harris come in there, make three big catches over there for him. Just, just keep the ball moving. And of course, Dez does his thing. And then we're going to talk about Williams. I mean, Teddy Williams, this guy's making big plays. He's averaging about, you know, 17, 18 yards a crack. I like what I see from an offensive standpoint, and, uh, and, but my concern is defense. But let's talk about the offense a little bit more, that offensive line and how I think they have grown up a little bit. Yeah, uh, one thing that I noticed with, with Houston's defensive front, they put you in uh, kind of a hybrid, odd, odd defense fronts, put you in pos positions where you get four techniques to where you get one-on-one -on -one matchups with J.J. Watt. He's, he does an excellent job of getting on the backside because, one, he has so much leverage and reach. <laughs> so, uh -huh. you know. J.J's a beast now. Yeah, right? he, no, John, yeah. no, no, offensive lineman, right? Yep. All right, yep. now yep. offensive lineman, play with the big boys, got that national ring on his finger yep. over there, guys. Uh -huh. No, he got that from somewhere. Uh -huh. He just didn't get that. I mean, this guy can play. Uh -huh. How would you handle J.J. Watt if you were in a game like this? Well, you know, my thing is you got to – Preparation, you know, it goes back from getting ready, film, film review, film review, film review, film review. And the thing <laughs> that I notice about uh, how I would approach JJ one, I have the advantage of fighting, going toe to toe with him because I have an extremely long reach myself. So <laughs> my thing is knowing what he's effect, what he's effective at, and he's effective with the the arm over. And when they're in that four eye position, you know he's going to try to get it up to your backside mm -hmm. shoulder. When, when that happens, you gotta have a, you got to have a plan of action. So going into a game, you got to know what he's going to do before he does it. Well, that says a lot about the Cowboys offensive line. They're young. They've improved. They most certainly held J.J. Watt, kept him in check, and I thought they did a great job. But when you look at the Cowboys, in, terms for, in, in order for them to go big, or when I say go big, to take another step or, or take a huge step playing against Seattle, they're going to have to improve on defense. Rolando McClain, I think this guy's a beast in the middle. I think he's, he's big, he's natural, he's strong, and he's nasty. And that's what it takes to be a, you know, a middle linebacker. But when he was out the game, and, and we'll talk about that as well, when he was out the game uh, going into overtime or right before the, before the end of the game, the Houston Texans were able to move the march of ball down the field. And obviously his loss to that ball club is huge. Mm -hmm. What do you think about them in terms of the overall run defense for, that, for the Cowboys as well as the loss of McClain? Well, you know, the thing that, that is kind of the gift and curse for the Cowboys defense is that you've got to have outstanding linebackers and they have to be instrumental in one coverage pressure green dog and getting to the quarterback and putting the quarterback in positions to throw the ball away you know now the, the Cowboys are, are tied for tied on defense for 24th they're the 24th defense in the league right now I mean what you're saying is that they're not very good <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, let's just get well, to the bottom line. I mean, well, they're well, they're well, not very good. Well, what it boils down to is, is that they have to go up against Seattle in Seattle, which has one of the best offenses in the league, if not maybe number one. I may be wrong on that. I think but you're they, a little off on that one, but <laughs> we, we, we'll play with that. How but about I, that? But yeah. I, I definitely know that, that playing in Seattle, I personally know it's a hostile environment. Uh, their defense is going to de definitely have to step up. But I do know that Seattle is playing good ball. And – and going into Seattle, that's going to be that's going to be the pinnacle of what it's going to be the stand, standard or the trademark of who the Cowboys are this upcoming season. So would, would you say it was safe to safe to say that this last game could prepare the Cowboys for Seattle? I mean, we're looking at they're playing at home. Uh, <laughs> they're in a team that's probably I mean, they're at home with a crowd that's, that was dominated by Houston. I was at the game physically on the sideline and I could not hear. I could not hear when the Cowboys had the ball because the defense or the fans were screaming so loud and it made it tough on Roma. And any time at home, and I can't recall ever in my career in a situation where we went to a silent count playing in our home stadium. I mean, that's got to be ridiculous. And, but, you know, Seattle, I mean, they've got that, what is that sound machine that they got out there? I mean, mm -hmm. they, where they measure the sound of the game and, and how mm -hmm. loud the crowd gets. And I've been up there. I've broadcasted the games up there, and mm -hmm. it gets loud, loud up there. Yeah. And they see that meter just, you know, go up and up and up, and they just try to scream as loud as they can. Mm -hmm. Can the Cowboys handle that type of defense out there or an offense that's led by, you know, Russell Wilson? Well, the, the thing that, that the Cowboys definitely have to do is offensive-wise, they got to bring – pick up the pace and not saying that they haven't but they have to pick up the pace put them in third and short situations and get the crowd out of it when they get the crowd out of it now they can go to they go to their guns get to DeMarco the ball 
get them toting the rock, and then put them in a position where they have to play fourth quarter football. And there you have it from Jonathan Scott. We'll be right back with more Sports Plus at Henry's Tavern. They've been around longer than the Dallas Cowboys, and you can trust one thing, that Herbs will treat you like family. Since 1956, Herbs has been putting customers first with exceptional customer service, quality work, and a hassle-free experience. Herbs takes an unpleasant experience and makes it a pleasant one, and that is what makes Herbs Peyton Body number one. They took care of me, and they'll take care of you, too. Tis the season to be scared, and I know one thing about you that we have in common. We love scary movies. Yes, we do. And, you know, we went down to Fantastic Fest, and we saw a whole bunch of things that make oh, yes. go bump in the oh, night. Right, exactly. <laughs> However, this one was not there. This one is coming into theaters this Friday and on demand, and I know you're going to like this one. It's called The Houses October Built, and it's about a crew of people who do a sort of found footage documentary thing. That's crazy. Where they go around to all these haunted houses to try and find a legitimate scare. Right, and there's a lot of people who do that. My parents have that background. They love to do that whole thing. I mean, it's like they go on these these adventures, and I'm like, I, I did it one time. I was like, okay, I'm done. Like, it's too creepy. I can't do it. <laughs> have you found a, a truly haunted house that really scares you? I mean, there's one that I in the colony that actually it was called the Crider House, and for years it was you know people would stay there every Halloween and they get their freak you know, they freak out, um, and then they closed that whole road down, so it burnt down and they closed the whole road down. So I mean, there's probably sort some sort of legend behind that. I need to look into it more. All right, that sounds good to me. Well, I got to talk to the crew that's involved in this, and I can't say what happened to them, good or bad. Right. However. They're all from Dallas, which is really, really cool. That's they really now cool. live in L.A. and they're doing their thing out there. But this movie is going to give you a little, little bit of a creepy feeling. So let's check out The Houses October Built. Congratulations on this film. This is so much fun. And what a perfect timing for Halloween. And people are going to haunted houses right now. And this Friday they actually get to see it. Were you guys big fans of going to haunted houses yourself growing up? Was that sort of the, the start of this? I think we all were, but but yeah. Brandy, that's why we cast yeah. her. <laughs> if she had been too big a fan, then we wouldn't have gotten the scares we needed. <laughs> I know you went to a lot of locations in Texas. I know some people are going to ask, are, are these places for real? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That was very important to us. Is yeah. We wanted people to be able to go on a ride, um, even after watching the movie. So to separate ourselves from a lot of the other movies that, that fall under this, this genre, is we wanted to use as many real people in real places as we could. So all the scare actors are real, all these places are real, there's a list of them in the credits. So, you know, when you're done, you can go on and basically you can, you can meet some of the same characters we did if, if you want. We wanted audiences to question, wait, is this real, is this not real? And, you know, people have computers in their phones, so they'll walk out of the movie and go, come on guys, and Google these places and then go, wait a second, this actually exists. Uh, were there some places that were truly scary to you? I was That's scared brandy. everywhere. <laughs> I was scared at every single place. So it's a genuine scream. So. Yes, yeah. So um, almost too much. You know, it's the way I was describing it earlier. Is that for me? It's like a, it's like a workout. I really come out because I'm I'm scared every single time. So that I, if I, I walk out of that hunt, I'm like, like breathing heavy, like just like can't can't do it. So, but yeah, they were all actually really scary to me. I don't know about these guys. Yeah, but. Some the scare actors, were, some of them were very, very method. And they didn't break character. And you, count, you yell cut, they still didn't break character. So that's when it starts to get a little real. And every house has their own way of doing things, or whatever, you know, each one at different themes or whatever, and different things work for different people. You know, Brandy can be scared by a pin drop, you know, but other people it takes a little bit more. Some people are more into the sets and just the realism of a body laying across the table or whatever other people, you know, um, whether it's clowns, you know, which is a big theme in our movie or sadistic doctors, everything is different at each haunt. And so there's something for, for everybody. Some things don't work for people, some things do, but they take a lot of pride in what they do too and really stick to their themes. So it's always fun to see what, what house does what. Yeah, well, and we're so happy to have you back here in Dallas. This has got to be cool. I know you're making the rounds, but to, to get to come back home, what do you get to do while you're here? 
We have to do this. this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're actually we've we've taken an RV from LA and it, for our kind of press tour and are hitting haunts along the way and having fun with that and getting the word in about the movie. But we're also going to be loading up in the RV in a couple days and driving to the Telluride Horror Show, where that's where we're going to premiere The Hell is October Build. So uh, we're kind of living out the movie ourselves again. We may uh, we may stop by uh, Plano Senior High because I think it's a it's a different. All four of us went to the same high school, which mm -hmm. I I think is kind of a rarity in movies or or whatever company you may have. Um, and so that kind of camaraderie and still being friends after so long. I'm uh, faking it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really friends. <laughs> but it's it's, it's a, I just think it's a it, you know it's just kind of a different rare case and hopefully that bleeds on the screen the chemistry so. So what do you think is the one moment or scene that, that will stand out to you when people ask you about this years from now? Oh, that was pretty fun to work on, right? What, what is the moment that you go, oh, I, I'm never going to forget this? You know, it's different, though, because when I've screened it with different people, different things work. Like I was talking about the haunted houses. I'll see somebody get scared. And I'm like, that did it for you. And maybe it's I, I wouldn't think that that would work. And other ones, I'm like, oh, watch, watch. They're going to be scared on this. And then that one doesn't work for them, but it works. It just it depends on who the people are and what actually works for them. And there's a lot of great scenes in there. And uh, I think the realism um, is one of the biggest scares throughout the whole movie, that it's just creepy on a lot of the stuff that goes on at these haunts and how some of the workers are and taking it too far, maybe. So I think that's a big character in itself of, uh, of creating scares. Well, everybody has a different phobia, yeah. you know, and whether you're afraid of clowns or spiders or, um, but I think being, surrounded by a hundred scare actors in costume as we were in the RV, that sticks out to me because it's just, that's just not okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, since tis the season for Halloween, what are your favorite scary movies? I like the first half of It. I have to just say the first half because the first half is probably one of the scariest things I've ever seen. And it was on television, if, you know, it wasn't even at the theaters and to go to those links Back, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, I uh, was tough. I, you know, the, the second half, I just never even count. I only own the first half DVD. It's two DVDs, I just threw away the second half. Mine's The Shining. Uh, yeah. I read The Shining in sixth grade. It was the first kind of horror book and, and my first introduction to Stephen King. And then to watch that movie and kind of see what I had read and what was in my head and then to have it play out, that was terrifying. Uh, Candyman. <laughs> say it three times. Yeah, don't no, say it too many times. Because I think for That's me one. it was more, it's scary, but then it was another thing, you know, because I watch it when having girls and we're sleeping over and it was kind of a dare. You would be like, okay, now go to the bathroom and see if you do it. And some people would do it. And see if you can do would. what? No. <laughs> I'm not saying it. Uh, I was, yeah, The Shining for sure. Um, anything involving religion and possession has always been a big thing for me. The omen, stigmata, that one really screws with me for some reason. Um, Pet Cemetery is great. It's a really one that you should revisit if you haven't seen it in a while. That one really gets you. And The Ring scared the hell out of me. Went to see that by myself so in a theater. he doesn't just one is what he's trying to say. I love horror, right? <laughs> now, not to ruin anything, but not everyone makes it out okay, as maybe they shouldn't. But do you see this could be uh, some sort of franchise? People could be going to different haunted houses? Well, I think the, the haunt world is, the, the, the haunt universe is so huge. And, and now even more so, um, we, we got a call. Some of the guys helping out building some in the UK, building out in South America. Um, so it was, it's funny because Halloween is a, it's an English holiday first, and we've kind of commercialized it. Now the rest of the world is kind of following suit. Um, and it's, it's so big. I mean, 30 million just Americans go alone a year. Um, so what we'd like to do is we definitely, we'd like, we tried to lay the tracks for mythology. And some of it's very small detail, but there's a lot out there that, um, you know, the, the blue skeletons out there in this world, they do exist. And, and as society goes into every Halloween, they're going to want more and more extreme things to happen. Um, and, and with that, I think we have more of a story to tell. I just hope we don't keep losing cast members because we started at five and now we're at four, as you can see. So Well, it's definitely creepy. It definitely gets to you, and I think people are going to love this. So congratulations again on the film. Thank, Thank you. you so much. What do you think? Well, that's creepy. <laughs> that's awesome. You just wait. I can't wait to see you in the theater. You're going to jump. No, you're going to have to hold me. Are you jumpy? A little bit, yeah. A little bit? A little bit. All right. Well, next we're going to discuss more movies, but first, boo! Ah, I didn't get her. I knew that was coming, because I knew that was coming. But if you knew it was coming? 
It, yeah, it's so scary. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, stay tuned for more on Sports Plus next. I'm Tony Hill, and this is my partner, Jonathan Scott. And make sure to follow us at Sports Plus Show on Facebook and Twitter. And we'll be back next week on Sports Plus.